Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Future Hacker. I'm your host, Maria Taigi, and you know how we've been frequently covering how the lifelong learning culture will not only be driving us to a better future, but will be mandatory for future leaders. So today's guest is one of the best examples I could ever give you of taking that very, very seriously. Francisco Santolo, first of all, he's like a citizen of the world. He's the lifelong learner. And, you know, he's also the CEO and founder of Scalable, a global company builder, consultancy and entrepreneurship academy. He was named the startup hacker by Forbes and a finalist for AMBA Entrepreneur of the Year in 2021. He's a serial entrepreneur, consultant, trainer, MBA professor, influencer, and speaker. So as you can see, you know, he had to be our guest here at Future Hacker. Francisco, thank you so much for your time. Maria, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm so glad. Francisco, you know, you've been everywhere, literally. Uh, you went to renowned schools like Harvard, Stanford, Singularity, MIT, and the list goes on and on. You're using what you believe is the best of each of them for Scalable, but you put your own twist on that and you make it something more feasible to all entrepreneurs out there. So could you please, you know, to begin, just share with us your story? Okay. I started as a, as a corporate employee, started as a trainee. I used to live in, in Brazil and uh, worked for a cosmetics company that one, nowadays it's one of the leaders in the world. It was a great experience. It has been named the, the biggest B company in the world, very linked to sustainability and very taking care of, of, their, of their stakeholders in a fantastic way. So the experience was great. I started having a regional position, a managerial position, very young, 25, 26 years old. And I continued like this, like for 10 years till the moment in, in Kellogg, having a, after the MBA, a, a postgraduate course on general management. I had a networking class and that networking class changed my life. I discovered uh, in an exercise that every one of us very, very friends of each other already and very intimate with each other. We had never told us our dreams. We had a very different, difficult path, imagine, to, to reach our dreams. On the other hand, everyone was able to help each other and, and solve each other's dream in a minute in the moment we mentioned it. So I came back to, to Argentina. I was still working in this big corporation. And uh, I decided to, to start taking coffee once a day with one person. First, I started with friends, then with uh, unknown people. And I finished every conversation by, by saying, there must be something I can do for you that maybe it's easy for me, but that can make a difference in your life. And it was then when everyone started to ask me for help in their ventures. So by helping this group of people for like four months for free, I received uh, two companies. Two of them offered me like 20% of their company for me being in the board and helping them scale. And there, my love with entrepreneurship restarted. I had been an entrepreneur when I was young with the internet age. At 13 years old, I had founded the second chat program in Spanish over Merck. And uh, it became a group of entertainment websites. And, and by helping all these entrepreneurs, I was able to quit my company. I decided to become a full-time entrepreneur, helping entrepreneurs. Then I got another job in Middle East. But in the end, I decided to found Scalable, continuing doing this in more scale. I never imagined it would be so big. I never imagined I would have the chance of accomplishing the dream of making something global and impactful. But it grew very fast, and in one year and a half, it was leader already in Argentina in the training entrepreneurship space. I think I got there in the right time. It was just the exact moment when, when this was booming. And uh, then we, in 2018, we started the international expansion. 
it was kind of risky and 2018 was a terrible year everything went wrong <laughs> but uh, but i think I, I took the right decision I, instead of expanding to latin america i decided to expand to dubai to then open saudi arabia i went to india directly and i went to hong kong to open then china and nowadays we're in more than 20 countries we have graduates from more than 50 and we have more than 1500 graduates and we're doing consulting training and it's grown a lot that's a pretty cool story francisco and you know congrats on all, all your accomplishments so this is not going to be an easy question but what would be the three most valuable lessons you learned on your journey it's a wonderful question The first thing that comes to mind is that uh, it's super important to understand what your purpose in life is. And uh, if you don't get so far away, tr just try to think what you really want and why. That question, why, is super important. Why, in the end, do you, you really want to accomplish that thing? Because if you follow the traditional path or you make the mistake of believing others' definition of success... You may finish in a place and work a lot and work hard and do this long path to achieve things and get there where you really don't want to be. And you can see it with the famous people and in the movies, but it's not easy to ex escape from success. Sometimes we're worried about failure and I think success is something that should worry you too. Success that it's not your real success and your real success really needs to be well thought about. What do you really want? You want good relationships. You want to be spending time with people you care. How do you want to live? Which are the things that you imagine for yourself? Because this idea of building your own startup to be free or not to have a boss or to define how things are going to be or winning a lot of money to then be able to do anything and be free, they're like traps. They're not really like that. So uh, going into a lot of trouble by, by being kind of successful in the traditional term, I discovered that maybe you can achieve things in a much simpler way and you can live life in a more deeper way, in a more fulfilling way, just by understanding what your purpose is and being straightforward with yourself and not lying to yourself and being able to gain some self-knowledge and have a lot of humbleness and understand that we are simple as human beings. We're complex, but we are simple too. And in the end, what we want are, are simple things. We want love. We want to be respected. We want to, to relate with other amazing people. We want to achieve things, express our talent. So there are many ways to build a company and there are many ways to, to define how you're going to live your life. And uh, starting with the right definition of what you want It's key. And then I, by understanding this, the first thing I did is I added to my methodology. So I combined all these amazing new businesses methodologies with, okay, if we have powerful methodologies to achieve things, let's use them for something we really want. And let's not get trapped in something that's not what we really need. Yeah, I, I just feel that sometimes we're just using too much of our time complicating things, right? And that's one of the things that I did love about your methodology is how we are trying to make things more simple and feasible and approachable, right? No, people believe that if it's not complex enough, it's, if it's not uh, effort enough, it's not worth it. And in a sense, they trained us that the good things should get a lot of effort and work. And in a sense, it's intelligence is about achieving things in the most effective way. And sometimes the most effective way is so simple, so simple that we reject to, to take it, that path. And we complicate things, I don't know why. Sometimes we're afraid just of, of being successful. Being successful is not easy, as it seems. You need to be prepared to be successful. Exactly. And the definition of success by itself is different from people to people, right? Yes. Following the line of, of getting into this mindset of making things too complicated. So you believe that this old school business model, doing business plans and revenue targets, early stage investments and so on, they don't really apply to people when building your own business. So you, you are challenging most of Most of business school, I, I mean, all of business schools, basically. So wh why is that? Let's discuss that. 
in reality, I don't want to take credit for something I didn't invent. But uh, if you take, for example, there's a big movement of new methodologies for business starting in 1997, 2000, 2001, 2003. And one of these authors that I really believe is one of the geniuses in, in designing these new methodologies for entrepreneurship is, is Steve Blank. And Steve Blank has this famous phrase that is the, the business plan doesn't survive the first contact with the customer. And he clearly explains that a business plan is full of hypotheses and usually non-validated hypotheses. And even if you validate them in one moment, a little time goes by, those hypotheses may have changed or the assumptions may have changed. And if you follow blindly that plan, it will never work. And if you use it to get money and then try to execute something that you don't understand, usually it doesn't work either. So in a sense, what the new methodologies are about, it's leaving behind everything that has to do with I plan, I get money, I execute, and I then see what the result is with a lot of randomness in the process and starting thinking in a different way that in a sense, it's a much more flexible way, something much more aligned with the future that's coming. That it's this uh, buka future or some now, now they are calling it bunny, which means brittle, anxious, non-linear, and uh, incomprehensible. It's fantastic, that definition. And in a world where everything changes the whole time, and we can see it with COVID, but it's not the only thing, there won't be a new normal. You can't plan five years in advance. You can't imagine that whatever you imagine is going to work. You need to work in another way. So the new methodology is, is taught in a way in which you learn continuously, you had uh, you have spoken about this life learn learner, and I believe every one of us needs to become one. And uh, it's learning continuously through listening, through trying to get the signals that you have out there, testing, and once you get those insights, putting them into a business model that aligns which value you're gonna deliver to which stakeholder and how you're gonna capture that value, a flexible business model within which you put your strategy and then executing, but not executing directly what you put in the business model. You need to test it with customers through listening, through testing, through MVPs. That is another definition that has been very abused. Everyone talks about MVPs in a way they can sell software in an incomplete way, like more expensive. But, but in a sense, it's, the concept is totally different. And you do this testing and listening and only then you start selling and selling is much more about continuing testing till you get a repeatable sales roadmap in which you put $1 in and you take one more than $1 out in profits, not in revenue. And even the new methodology that talks about all these things, it's, it's methodology that is mentioned by the VCs and they say they read this methodology and they follow. But in a sense, it says that you shouldn't put money into the business till you have a repeatable and scalable model, which means all this seed investment and all these funds and accelerators and everything we see out there, it's not really respecting what they've learned in this new powerful methodologies. So it's interesting to, to think the new way and it's super powerful and it allows a lot of entrepreneurs without so many resources to do businesses that before were unthinkable of. And, you know, it makes so much sense to me being an entrepreneur myself, especially because, you see, when you're trying to get funding and you have all those numbers that you, uh, that you need to literally be making up to show to, to the investors. And, you know, I, I like to see all those startups in the crowdfunding platform and, and those things are clearly not real. And they're just in there because they have to be in there because of this, this model of doing things. And, you know, and discussing that, like the, this, I was going to say journey, but the, to being very honest, the nightmare that some VCs put the entrepreneurs on, do you think this model is even sustainable or do you think that the future will bring us something different, you know? I think the model was about to finish when COVID, the coronavirus hit. We were, had problems. Then you had the, uh, the German company with a credit card scandal. You had Uber that had done its IPO and it was going to become bankrupt any moment. They had funds still, but they were losing money like crazy. And then I, I thought Uber would be the, the last, the ending point of this journey. But then coronavirus helped the Uber Eats business and that rescued them for a moment. But in a sense, their business is 
in the it's part it's super competitive and and it's really difficult to get margins there so they're losing money and the uber traditional business has the difficulty that it doesn't have any barrier to entry the moment they buy the competition that they currently usually do they lost with grab in singapore and they bought karim in middle east and uh, they buy karim and in five minutes someone gets a uh, an app again that you can rent it online a new paper driver and immediately you have another competitor and the billions you spent away don't give you anything so i think uh, this ecosystem won't survive much i think it's helped by the the abundance of liquidity you have in the world it's crazy how liquid the world has become before covid the world was super liquid nowadays every plan usa is launching for the covid situation is three trillion dollars two trillion dollars and it's accumulating and that emission that they are doing monetary emission it's unbelievable so Soon enough, everyone will be able to access huge amounts of money. Even even the big VCs are funding themselves, not with investors anymore. SoftBank is funding themselves with uh, Japan Bank's loans. <laughs> Imagine. So they get the loans in the bank and then they lend it to entrepreneurs. They inflate the value they sell even before they get bankrupt or they get into trouble. And they win money with the fees in every round trying to show everyone they build good companies when in the end you don't even need to build a good company to win money with that model. You're just an intermediary. This is insane. So that's definitely going to change somehow in the future. But do you have the vision of how how is going to be the new, you know, the new model of raising funds, of financing for the future startups out there? I believe the the future doesn't require, this is kind of crazy, that the, the future doesn't require much funding. Because when people understand how new businesses work and new business theory works by starting with the testing and the listening, etc. In general, we're going to live in a world super abundant. Abundant in the sense that exponential technologies drive uh, costs and marginal costs down. Abundant in the sense that 3D printers will be able to print almost anything. Abundant in the sense that the logic of the first industrial revolution and the first corporations when Ford assembled the 4T in, in the assembly line doesn't exist anymore. Corporations were built to build at, at scale. Scale was necessary because you didn't have enough customers to buy things. They didn't have a lot of income. The middle classes were recently growing. The 20th century and 21st century, it's, they are the centuries in which the, the individuals start gaining strength for the first time. The world has always been dominated by very little people. The aristocracy was in proportion very, very small. And in the 20th century, it's been, if you see the Netflix shows about the crown, or now there's another one that's very interesting about the last Tsars in Russia, in the Russian Revolution, you immediately see that everything that's happening with technology in this century, it's about the 6D of, of exponential technologies, that it's democratization. When you have depreciation and demonetization, that there are two effects of technologies becoming exponential when they digitalize themselves, Then more individuals have more power, communities multiply their power, and whenever you realize the world has changed, and people want nowadays the goods can be produced, personalized for different niches, and these goods will be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and when you realize the production won't be the most important part of businesses, I mean, the capital that you used to need to produce in scale, In the end, we're all, majority of the businesses right now are skipping completely the value chain. And this access to the final customers is very easy and the installed production capacity is huge. So with this outsourcement of the corporations that gave their production and usually sales or logistics to, to third parties, nowadays everyone can access those things as an outsourcing. And in the future, everyone will be able to produce in a cheap way with their 3D printers, maybe with open source models. So I believe that the logic of business nowadays is starting by the customer and not starting by the production. Understanding who to serve and what they need and which are the pains and gains they need and finding then who can supply and becoming the, the facilitator for this to happen. In a sense, the platforms are the ones that are gaining a lot of strength 
in the future, I see something much more decentralized. I see a lot of people adding value to other people in communities in a direct way. Blockchain can become the, the way of intermediating. It's changing too much. It won't be even similar. Even the organizations will change completely. I, I don't see startups funded with a lot of money to scale. I think it's totally unupdated, it's like old, the way we're doing business in the traditional world. And it's all inspired by financial incentives, not by real generating value incentives. That's great, Francisco. You know, we're, we're getting into a little deeper into this technology piece and disruption of the market on the next episode. So stay tuned, everybody. This is the end of the first episode. We're coming next with Francisco Santolo on the next one. Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future.